Mississippi's unforgiving sun has baked the fertile soil, and the race is on to save corn, cotton, and soybean crops. Right now we're about to start irrigating because it's been so dry. Uh, we hadn't had a rain here in about three, four weeks, so this ground's getting real dry. And so man and machine add what nature is leaving out. It's a critical time for Taylor Pang soybeans. These beans are starting to fruit, so they're gonna need all the moisture they can get to thrive out here. Farming is tough work, even under the best of circumstances. Normally, these soybeans would eventually be on a ship to China, but the drought and the pandemic have made this an incredibly unpredictable year. COVID business-wise has affected it because of the market. Uh, not many countries right now are buying crops right now, soybeans, corn, cotton. Pang's grandfather was born here in 1910. It makes Taylor a fourth generation farmer in the dirt of Mississippi's Delta. Chinese American with a deep Southern drawl, and he has heard about it his entire life. Uh, you're from the South. <laughs> That's a heavy Southern accent. These are the faces of the many Chinese families that settled in Mississippi more than 100 years ago. After moving here as a source of cheap labor in the 1880s, many Chinese families like Min Sang, the Tams, and Lin Yin opened grocery stores, anchoring families and making them a key part of the economic landscape. But today, many sons and daughters have left the Delta for greener pastures in finance, health care, and other jobs. And those who stayed... COVID for the, universe, for the community, the Chinese community, um, has really put them socially distanced. Um, the community that we have here left in the Delta are an older community. Emily Jones is the curator of the Mississippi Delta Chinese Heritage Museum. It's probably no shock to learn Chinese here faced harsh discrimination at one time, but that was decades ago. Today, the community is accepted. However, Jones has heard from Chinese Americans who left the Delta, and many are enduring an anti-Asian bias that sadly has come with COVID-19. I'm astounded that it's even an issue. I, I just feel like we're more separated now than we've ever been. We want to be together and, you know, appreciate the diversity, but it seems like it's, the more we talk about diversity, the more walls we put up between each other. Housed at the museum, just your average work desk from a man that is anything but average. Gilroy Chow left the Delta at a young age and went to work at Grumman Aircraft on its F-111 and A-6 fighter aircraft. Then, in 1965, a conversation that changed his life. There's this other thing that we're building, the lunar module that we're gonna to send to the moon as part of Project Apollo. And uh, we'd like you to work on that. And just like that, Chow was off to Cape Canaveral along with the best and the brightest. Uh, this is out of the launch pad. He worked on the lunar module that carried Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon in 1969 and was instrumental in bringing the crew from Apollo 13 home safely. But these days, the 80-year-old who once reached for the stars rarely leaves his home. Again, COVID. We uh, have taken a lot of precautions to say uh, safe at home. In fact, the coronavirus has claimed two family members close to Chow. Our children, once it happened, told us the protocols and what they expected from us, and we have pretty much respected that. COVID also forced the cancellation, marking the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13 and successfully returning three astronauts to Earth after an accident in space. In the famous scene from the 1995 movie Apollo 13, okay, let's build a filter. NASA scientists have to somehow concoct a filter to remove dangerous carbon dioxide levels from the lunar module using only materials on the spacecraft. Chow says, oh yeah, that really happened. And he had an integral job in it all. And I had the specific role of getting the hardware together because we had the parts in Florida. But in the movie, no tip of the cap to Chow. Just a handful of white guys in short sleeve dress shirts, not one Asian face. You know, I, I never thought about that. It's been pointed out to me, but out of 
the thousands of people down at the Space Center. My roommate and I were the only Asians. George G. is from Ruville, Mississippi. To Chow, what matters is the fact his colleagues appreciated his work, like astronaut Fred Hayes, who upon his return rewarded Chow with a small piece of netting from inside the lunar module. I've got to take the guys something back. I mean, that was what he told me. If COVID cooperates, Chow says they plan to hold the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13 in October. It's like uh, going to the casino, basically. October, early fall, will also be an important time for Taylor Pang. He will need a break from the droughts and COVID if he will make money on his crops this year. Regardless, Pang remains proud of fighting through a pandemic, proud of his heritage, and proud of the standing Chinese Americans have here in the Deep South. We've just been so relevant here for generations that people know who we are and they respect us and everybody will help everybody. We're all neighbors and if anybody's in need, we're always willing to help. And that is something no virus can destroy. Sean Caleb's CGTN in the Mississippi Delta.